that perspective. When I was preparing for this teaching, actually it brought me back to the experience that I had 11 years ago when I was in high school. So in general, since young, I love to study. I like going to school, um, studying for exam. I like to get good grades. And basically, I just love school so much. I abide the rule Asian without Asian kind of um, lifestyle. So, when I went to high school, um, my school had a different grading system. So, um, they include the participation um, in class to, um, how's it? They include our participation to grade whether we are really good or not in that particular subject. So we need to be active in class, ask questions, we need to answer the questions from the teacher, we need to be able to present well, to have group discussion, and um, basically what I had in mind is just be more talkative in class, don't be so quiet in class. So even though my grade was quite okay, um, I was deep incompetent because I was too quiet in class. Um, my, as a student, everyone around me seemed to say that, you know, everyone like my teachers, uh, my mentors, seniors, my friends, you know, the school itself, emphasize that, you know, people who can be successful are those who can network, are those who can present well, are those who can um, discuss in a group well. And so I struggle a lot. Um, in the mind of, you know, 15 year old me, I realized that if I don't do that, I cannot get good grades. I cannot go to the good university. Um, I cannot get a good job. I cannot get a good life. So, then I was just created to be a failure. I, I will not be successful after all. That's when I started to ask questions like, why, why was I so quiet? Why couldn't I talk more in class? And why was I created like this? That was a question that I asked a lot during that time because I was struggling. So I think in life we we met uh, we meet with this kind of um, situation a lot. We meet with failures. We have a lot of unmet expectation, and this expectation can actually come from um, in in many forms. It can be um, like pressures, standards, targets suggestion or even advices and opinions, they can um, impose certain standards towards us and that can come even from ourselves. We know that from all these voices, we, we, we cannot follow them all. But sometimes they all seem good and we just don't know which one to choose. And another time we, we wonder whether we should even listen to them at all. So now um, I want to ask you to write five things if you have your paper, pen or your phone. Um, write five things that identify you. You can write like, I am a student, or I am a daughter, I am a parent soon to be, or I am <laughs> anything that identifies you, or I am you know, someone trying really hard to, to live well, or anything, five things that identify
that we listen to more than others. For example, um, we listen to the norm and the trend of the society that we live in, not the culture in, let's say, Mongolia or in the Middle East. We listen to the society here in Singapore or in Asia. And we listen more to our spouses, our parents, our friends, rather than strangers and acquaintances. Why? If you look at our answers, the, the five things that identify us, I realize that I think we are more likely to be affected by expectation or opinions or, or, or any, um, anything that people say um, that are related to our answer. If, let's say, for example, for many, you write, I am a parent, or, you know, I know I am a parent. When people say, you know, to be a successful parent, uh, your kid must be successful too in class, in, in school. That will affect you more than it will affect me, because I, right now, am not a parent. And for me, one of the answers that I have is to be an, I am an inspiring writer. So if people say that you know to be an inspiring writer, you should read one novel a day and then write a lot to practice your skill. Whether I can meet that expectation or not, whether I listen to it or I do it, um, it impacts me more than it impacts anyone else here who are not aspiring to be a writer. So either way, it just affects me, whether I like it or not, it just affects me. So um, you may not have the time to be doing the teaching, but I think if you reflect more later on, for the things that identify you, um, it may give us some more uh, insight on how those things actually affect us in our lives. So in that sense, we are affected by the expectation that relates deeply to our identity. Or another reason is expectation from the people who are important to us. Um, so if that is the case, actually, to discern which expectation we should listen to, or in general to cope with our life expectation, we should ask the big question, which is, who am I? Who are we actually? Before we are a parent, before we are a student, before we are a worker, a daughter, a, a doctor, a lawyer, or before I am an aspiring writer, who are we in the first place? We are all son and daughter of God. That is our first and true identity. So if we are the children of God, then what is God's expectation of us? What is His greatest commandment for us? If we turn to the Bible from Matthew, um, chapter 27, uh, 22, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So, this is the greatest commandment that we all have, which is love. In doing everything, in trying to um, filter whatever expectation coming to us, this is our filter, which is to love. This is our first thing first. St. Augustine said, love God and do whatever you do. He continued by saying, if you hold your peace, hold your peace out of love. If you cry out, cry out in love. If you correct someone, correct them out of love. If you spare them, spare them out of love. Let the root of love be in you. Nothing can spring from it but good. And this first thing first is very important because living in this world, we are crowded by so many things. And this is um, the thing that will keep us um, from being distracted for being lost into the crowd. And in our life, we should see everything else as a means to this end, to this end of um, loving God. Our parents may expect us to, you know, oh, we should be rich, work in this um, profession, you should get married, create a happy family, and all that. They may expect us to do so. But that's not the goal. Our goal is to love God. If along the way, while we are loving God, while we are working for God, while we are loving our neighbor, God gives us richness and success and marriage, someone to live your, your, um, your life with, that's a gift. So that's just a gift. 
Now, how we can actually prioritize God in, in our daily life? It's quite an abstract um, ideal to actually do it. So for me, one thing that actually works is, um, is detachment. I didn't know that detachment was so important, but it actually mattered so much to help me not to, to drift in the crowd. So one day, um, oh, as you all know that um, for the past one or two years, I think I've been complaining that I don't like my work, that you know it's quite boring, every day it's just the same, and I wanted to do something else. So one day, um, seems like God answered my prayer. My boss told me I cannot renew my contract because there is some problem with the research funding. They cannot hire a foreigner. I'm not PR yet, so so I only have a few months to to stay there. So you know, God answered my prayer. Since you don't like it there, let's just get you out of there. But actually, I think God wanted to say something else to me during that incident. Um, after my boss said that to me, I felt quite liberated. I remember keep telling myself, so it's only a few months, do your best, leave good impression, leave something useful for the lab, and if things turn out bad, it's okay, you're going to leave anyway. And for the first time, um, working for God phrase made sense to me. Because I went to work, my work become more sincere. I just do it because, you know, I, I want to offer this to God. But I just don't care whatever my boss or my senior is telling me. This is my best and sincere effort. If it's not good enough, that means it's really meant to be that I shouldn't stay here. You know, that kind of thing. But one thing is it became more sincere. And I realized that maybe people who had a shorter time to live, those who are battling with their own disease or, you know, who, who are dying, they, they know this better than us. They are being detached slowly from the world that they know their time to live on earth should be lived to the full. Not just to please everyone around them, to listen to, listen to the expectation of people around them. So, I think once we get the important thing, we can let go of the rest. Which is for us, our first thing first is again to love God. Maybe my um, example is actually quite simple, but if we turn to this example from St. Francis. So St. Francis is, uh, was, before his conversion, he was a popular guy, he was rich, he liked to party, he was the leader of the crowd, and he decided to become a knight. His dad also uh, expected him to become a knight. But one day after his conversion, he decided that he wanted to let go of everything to become a friar. He didn't listen to, to his dad's expectation to become a knight. He was quite extreme to the point that he cut ties with his father just to say that I'm going to follow my heavenly father, not you know this earthly father. But from this we can see after his conversion. Each path that St. Francis took on his journey to God actually led him to only one action, which is to love and praise God. Um, for me, personally, I can see this from his canticle of the sun. He said, All praise be yours, O Lord, for brother sun, for sister moon, for sister water, brother fire, and sister earth. And from here, I can really see how all God's creation is a means, is means for him to see God, to see the Creator. And even when he is dying, he prays God for sister death, because death is the only one that will rejoin him back to God. So when we can see God in everything else, uh, we can make everything else as a mean, we can um, put our first thing first back again into loving God. So, okay, now... So now we know that, okay, we are children of God, we are loving God, we are detaching ourselves from other things. But what God exactly wants us to do? Because St. Francis has uh, his own extreme ways maybe of loving God, but how about us? We have our own 
um, unique journey too. In our lives, I think we like to look up to people who are more successful than us, whether it is spiritually or you know materially. We for spiritual life usually we read things of way of life or things book, and then for maybe um, our material life we will look at self help books or motivational books. So we are trying hard. If we want to increase our spiritual life, we would not waste our talent, which is um, is not all bad, which is good to try hard. But if we have this kind of mindset whereby if we don't sow, we don't reap, no action, no reward, we tend to do everything by ourselves. We tend to see that if we don't do anything, we will not get anything. But the Lord's way is different from that. God never mentions that, oh, I will only love those who never sins, or I will only love those who can do more work, or those who appeals to me. But He loves everyone. He even gave us the harvest before, um, before we can do anything. The harvest which is um, love through His love through Jesus. So when we are trying hard to achieve something spiritually or, or even physically, we must be careful not to put those things as the end. And if we look at this um, Bible verse about Mary and Martha, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. So from here we can see that Mary put Jesus as her number one priority. So she felt at peace, she doesn't need anything else, she's not distracted by, um, by other people or by anything else that uh, she should do, because she knows that her first thing first, Jesus, the person of Jesus, that's all she needs. On the other hand, Martha, she was so distracted by all the preparations. She is distracted by how well the serving must be made, maybe how well the cook must be served. So she became concerned about how other people do not meet her expectation as well. And this shows how she put her priority not in Jesus, but her priority has shifted to the work and the serving. So it is really good to work and to serve, especially if you want to serve Jesus, but just don't be too busy to miss Jesus. Um, no lose sight of Jesus is you know, our only priority. Mary here should be our example in following what God wants us to do in our lives without being distracted by anything else. So another thing is when we have uh, this mindset of getting reward after hard work, we feel that we deserve what we get, we earn what we get. So when we are work-minded, we own things, we take God out of, out of the picture. But if we are gift-minded, you know, we thank God for it, we use the gift, but we, we are ready to give them away as soon as we are asked to. So, I think we need to realize that everything that we have is actually a gift, whether it is our expectation, uh, whether it's our weaknesses or our strength or whatever it is, our experiences, they're all a gift from God. So 11 years ago, during you know my high school experience, little did I know that I was only an introvert. I was not incompetent, but I didn't know that. Now I realize that being in introvert is a gift from God. I mean, it's something that I should take as a gift. It's not something that I should work on to change. 
change here means I should not work to become more like Tommy or someone else who is more you know like cheerful and then so I don't know talkative. <laughs> but I can see my introversion as something uh, a strength that maybe other people do not have, you know. So I can work with it to um, to to love God in my own way, to serve Him in my own way, not to change to someone else. So knowing myself actually helps me to um, to to liberate me because expectation just matter less after that. When people expect me to to just you know you should say more, you should talk more. I myself can understand that. Okay, maybe you, you want me to become like that, but I'm not. I'm a bit different from what people expect me to be. But I have my own way of doing things and my way of loving God. And I think that's that's all that matters. And in this world, there is no one perfect ruler that can measure everyone fairly. It's just unfair to use one ruler to for everyone. Maybe other people will not realize it, but you know, God created us all differently. And so in our weaknesses, in our hardships, in our failures, in those unmet, unmet expectations, what does God say to us? This message is actually very striking to me. This is from the Consoling Heart of Jesus. This is what God said to Father Michael Gately. Walk with me, don't walk ahead, and don't let like behind. God is the only one that knows us best. He is so gentle and so merciful. We always say that I am meek and humble. And He is really gentle in imposing expectation on us. He is the one that knows us best. So with all that being said, if God is ever so gentle on us, I think we should also gentle towards other people and towards ourselves in imposing that expectations. So when we feel overwhelmed with those expectations around us um, from ourselves or from other people, when we feel like we are sinking beneath those expectations, when we are living in a world that sometimes cannot stop talking, just remember that those voices are not absolute. What is absolute is this God's word. Heaven and earth will pass in the